participation with the Latinx Heritage uh, Month at Field Museum. It's, uh, I'm Bruce Patterson, former, I guess, curator emeritus of mammals here at the museum, and it's a special pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Rafaela Masagia from the University, Federal University of Minas Gerais. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher who's been working here at the Field Museum for nine months, uh, for six months, I guess. Hafa uh, got her, her bachelor's at the Federal University of Lavras in 2012, her master's at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte uh, in 2014, and her PhD in 2019 from the same university. She began her work uh, in mammals with fossil mammals, uh, studying the relationship, systematics, and taxonomy of peccaries, uh, both living and fossil. And she developed during that time a paleontologist's appreciation for morphology and the in insights that morphology can offer on ecology and behavior. She carried that forward in her doctoral program, which focused on rodents, to study one of the most interesting groups of rodents in South America, the Acodontini, a, a tribe of rodents that's most diverse in Atlantic forest and uh, the arid diagonal of South America, and has achieved a remarkable radiation of trophic locomotory uh, uh, and ecological habits generally. And uh, during her doctoral work, Hafa got a, a, a CAPES a fellowship, sandwich fellowship, and spent a year here at the Field Museum doing her doctoral studies and worked through all of our Akadon teeny collections and did a fabulous job with her dissertation, part of which will appear in today's presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce somebody who is uh, well known to many of us and who's really now an expert in both um, morphology, functional morphology and comparative methods. Hafa, please. Thank you, Bruce, for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm delighted to, to be here today as part of the Latinx Heritage Month. Um, and as Bruce said, I'm from Brazil and it's not my first time here at the Field Museum. Um, in 2017, I was here as a Sandwich Fellow, which is the name the Brazilian government uh, gives to students, PhD students that go abroad. And during that time, I used to come to every one single one of the seminars and it's truly an honor to be here, standing here in front of you today. And I'm gonna talk about a topic that I find uh, deeply uh, fascinating, and I hope you will too, uh, which is predatory rats. And more specifically, uh, I'm gonna talk about their connection uh, to the line of research I've been pursuing since my PhD. So I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce this topic by mentioning the book by Dogo Dixon, uh, that talks about the zoology of the future, or what we could or um, what we could expect from evolution after the extinction of the human species, hence its name uh, after man. And in this book, the author predicts a rapid extinction of the carnivores we know today uh, due to their sensitivity to fluctuations in prey uh, populations and their inability to feed on other types of resources. So the predators niche would then be occupied by predatory rats, uh, which we can recognize here uh, on this image by their rat-like tails uh, that would hunt insects and have their incisors transform into sharp teeth resembling the canines of current carnivores. So the scenario described in the book would be something like this. So rabbit-like prey. <laughs> Happy ending for the prey. <laughs> 
But this scenario seems very far for, from the rodents uh, we know today, which are usually small animals and opportunistic feeders. And part of that opportunistic behavior that they have in trophic ecology uh, is related to their school morphology. Uh, the well-developed ever-growing incisors uh, that are separated by the, from the cheek teeth by a long diastema um, allows access to a great range of resources, including mechanically resistant resor resources that the, they can uh, gnaw or chew, um, such as seeds and grass. And when we think about rodents, uh, we see them more as prey than predators. Usually when we think about predators, we think about mammals of the order carnivora, which includes, for example, some big cats like cheetahs and animals like wolves. And basically when you think about predators, we think about a big ferocious and bloodthirsty hunter. We usually don't think about a mouse, but if you look at this little guy, uh, it looks pretty much like a predator. This is Onychomys or the werewolf mouse, also known as the howling mouse because of this. She's a wolf in mouse clothing. <laughs> yeah, she's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> <laughs> So Onikom is housed to the moon as a territorial behavior, which is a more familiar trait uh, of predators that we are more used to. And Onikom is a very aggressive hunter, hunter that feeds on scorpions and centipedes and grasshoppers and even small vertebrates like lizards and other mice that can be even bigger than them sometimes. And its peculiar features have made this little guy very famous. A uh, quick search shows several uh, article uh, headlines that describe Onikomis as a badass and a hardcore mouse. And Onikomis may be the most famous predatory rodent, but it's not the only one. Uh, during the evolution of rodents, some species became very specialized predators, predators. Sorry. Uh, while, while many rodents occasionally eat other animals, uh, we are talking here about species that underwent significant changes in their phenotype in response to the demands of capturing and consuming live prey, which are the ones we call predatory rodents. Who have, for example, different guilds of predatory rodents like semi-aquatic fish eating species uh, in contrast to shrew-like earthworm eaters. Uh, and each of those have evolved independently uh, in different lineages of rodents. And these species show a wide range of different kinds of adaptation. Some of them appear to have invaded new niches uh, where they could find prey more easily, uh, adopting different life modes, uh, like for example, semi-aquatic and fossorial showing several locomotory adaptations like webbed feet for swimming and developed claws for digging. Onycoms itself uh, have evolved resistance to prey toxins through modifications of some metabolic pathways. So instead of inducing pain, uh, the sensory receptors uh, of onycomies can bind to the toxins of the prey and use them to block the pain signals that the venom is trying to transmit. So basically onycomies transforms venom, which could easily kill them into painkillers. And besides the aggressive hunting behavior of onycomies, we see some uh, other behavioral specializations in uh, other species like hydromis, uh, which is a semi-aquatic predator, predator that hunts uh, invasive cane toads in Australia. It was documented that they show a preference for larger toads uh, when comparing the size of frogs that usually fall on traps. And hydromis is also able to find and consume specific non-toxic organs only like the heart and liver, uh, as we see in this picture um, of a dead cane toad. Um, in some cases, uh, hydromis even removes the entire venom gland before consuming other parts of the animal. And of course, you cannot talk about adaptations related to diet uh, without mentioning the gastrointestinal tract. So the chitinous uh, exoskeletons that some of the species ingests uh, is related to some modifications of the, their stomach, such as the carnification of the inner layer of, of the stomach and the presence of 
uh, the so-called protective pocket called fun fundic region, which you can see here in the figure, um, which protects the soft tissue of the gastric glands from abrasion from those uh, exoskeletons that they ingest. And of course, they must be able to find and capture their prey. Here we have terminal bones uh, of predatory and non-predatory rodents. Um, and terminal bones are basically bony plates uh, covered by vascularized, vascularized tissue that projects from the inner walls of the nasal cavity. And they, ser they serve pr uh, primarily, uh, primarily two main functions, uh, which are thermal regulation and infection. And predators, uh, specifically ones that eat earthworms, uh, show a much more complex turbinal structure on the olfactory portion of the turbinals, as we can see here comparing the structures inside the red squares. And this may relate to a more developed olfactory sense, helping them to detect prey under underground or within the leaf litter. But here uh, in this talk, I want to focus on the morphology of the masticatory complex. And in order to do that, uh, I have to, at least to mention Palsidantomys vermidax. This species was found and described only in 2012, and is remarkable because it's the only known rodent that does not have molars. And in addition to the absence of molars, which indicates uh, to us that they have a very soft diet and do not chew much, or do not chew at all. Um, the elongation of the rostrum and the jaw, which are highlighted here in red, is very striking when we compare uh, the skull of the species uh, to that of a closely related, uh, more generalist uh, rodent. We will explore the connection between this feature, the, the rostrum elongation, and the predatory behavior in the next um, part of the talk. And Pasodentomys also presents another unique feature among rodents, which are incisors with two cusps to be able to kill and break this, uh, its prey into smaller pieces since it does not have any molars to chew. And when we look at the bicuspidated uh, incisors, it reminds us a little uh, of Doga Dixon's predatory rats and their caniniforms incisors. So um, some years ago for my PhD, I decided to investigate the morphological evolution of a group of neotropical rodents, uh, which are called the Acodontini tribe. The Acodontines uh, are part of the sigmodontine radiation in the neotropics, and they are the second most diverse in number of species with about uh, 90 recognized species today. So these are the Acodontines. Um, we have, of course, some generalist species, uh, but also some more uh, specialized fossorial, semi-aquatic, and of course, predatory species. Some people could say that they look like um, a bunch of little brown rats, but they are quite diverse in external morphology. Not only in external morphology, but they also show a wide range of school shapes. And this is why I select them as the focus of my PhD research. I wanted to investigate if their diversity in school morphology uh, could relate to their ecological um, diversity or differences. And I began this investigation uh, with the species called Bladinomys breviceps. It earned its name uh, from Bladina shrews because of their similar external morphology. And Bladinomys breviceps is um, known for its burrowing habits, habits. And our goal here was to investigate whether its co-morphology um, could provide insights into adaptations for burrowing as it's seen in other fossorial rodents. And I did promise to discuss new techniques on this talk, but what initially drew me into this topic of predatory rodents was one of the oldest methods in comparative biology, which is morphological descriptions. And by doing a comparative description um, of the skull of bladenomys with other acodontines, we found something intriguing. First, First, something less intriguing, uh, but still interesting, we did in fact saw some features related to the fossorial lifestyle of this animal. Uh, for example, we saw that they present a very small optic foramen when compared to non-fossorial species, uh, where the, uh, the optic foramen is highlighted here in red. Above is bladenomys optic foramen and below a codons, we can see it's very um, 
much larger in a codon. And this small optic foramen suggests a somewhat less developed opt optic nerve and also a, a low developed, uh, less developed vision capacity. And this trait is often seen in, uh, in species that live in low light environments as fossorial species. But the more interesting thing we found uh, were features that were common only to species that feed on invertebrates, such as the roaster elongation in a less extent um, of what we saw in postdentomies, but they still show some roaster elongation and the narrowing of the zygomatic plate, highlighted here in red too. Uh, and this tells us something about the reduction of the areas of attachment of some masticatory muscles. And uh, again, for the top of this talk, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why this matters. So um, after this, after the, this uh, first paper, uh, it became clear to me that the several species of predatory acodontines could be an interest top topic of research. And I narrowed my focus to the morphology of the school of invertebrate eating acodontines. But the first thing was to define which species were predators and which were not. And this is an important issue to everyone working with the ecology or trophic ecology of small mammals. What do they in fact eat? We had some information, uh, but they were mostly like this, uh, subjective and kind of vague, still useful of course, but mainly lacking any quantitative data about stomach content, although we did have some of that too. And ideally to infer diet, we should be able to accumulate uh, inf information from different sources, um, such as uh, direct feeding observations, functional morphology, stomach contents, and also stable isotopes, so that we can get closer to what can be called the true diet, considering the potential diet, that is what the animal is capable of consuming, an estimated diet, which is limited by our own capacity uh, to obtain and process this kind of information. And back in 2017, talking to Bruce Patterson about the hard time, very hard time I was having when trying to categorize some of the species according to their diet, mainly because of conflicting data that I would found in different sources. Uh, he suggested we use stable isotopes to find out what they were eating. So what are stable isotopes and why do they carry any information about diet? Stable isotopes are versions of the same chemical element that differ in the number of neutrons. And, that, and they are called stable because they do not undergo decay as the radioactive uh, isotopes. And during, during the ingestion of food, uh, part of the food is assimilated and part is excreted, but the part that is assimilated, um, in that part, the heavier stable isotopes are retained in the organic tissues, while the lighter isotopes are more quickly consumed in metabolic reactions. So the organic tissue uh, has what we call an isotopic signature, which is simply the ratio between heavy and light isotopes of a given element. And isotopes can be used in different contexts, uh, but in trophic ecology, we can infer the trophic level uh, of a specimen based, based on the nitrogen isotope values and as they go higher, uh, it means the animal is higher up in the food chain. And also we can infer the photosynthetic pathway of consuming plants uh, based on the carbon isotopes. Uh, higher values of carbon isotopes indicate a diet of C4 plants and lower values uh, indicate a diet of C3 plants. But of course, this is a gradient. And uh, other factors such as stress uh, can also affect these values which means they should be read very carefully. And scientific collections house several types of organic tissues uh, that can be used in this analysis, such as hair and bones, uh, which expands the scope of trophic studies that we can do covering a large um, temporal and geographical range. And that's why we chose to do this for acodontines. So we collected almost 150 hair samples from uh, something about like uh, 50 uh, species of acodontines, I think the right number is 47, uh, to see where each one will fall uh, into the so-called uh, trophic niche space. So this 
would be the trophic niche space with nitrogen values uh, on the y-axis and carbon value values on the x-axis. And with this data, we could confirm some of that vague trophic information from other studies. And we also inferred that information uh, for some of the species for the first time, uh, especially the ones that were very, that are very hard to capture in the field and are also very rare in collections. But to tell the truth, uh, these results didn't solve our problem of diet categorization because we saw that most species consume at least some amount of animal matter, considering their relatively high nitrogen values. And that's why, um, that's when we started to realize that it's not about what they eat, but it's about what they can eat. Okay, but what can they eat? To, in order to investigate this, uh, we decided to um, calculate and study the functional morphology of their jaws uh, by quantifying the mechanical advantage of the masticatory muscles. So mechanical advantage is a proxy uh, generally used for liver systems, but widely used for the masticatory complex because it is a very clear liver system. And it describes a trade-off uh, between velocity and force which means that the jaw can be either strong or fast. And our main premise here uh, was that the faster jaws and hence lower mechanical advantages would be found on predators that need to capture live prey. And this would lead to weaker bites, telling us that these species were giving up some kind of resources, some more resistant resources as seeds and grass to rely mainly on soft, on soft animal matter. So we calculated the mechanical advantage of jaw closing muscles using each muscle's lines of action combined with the um, distance from the biting point to the jaw joint on the skull. And we estimated the bite force for each uh, species uh, using incisor variables that are related to the bending resistance. So here we have a jaw shape morphospace uh, plotted over heat maps of bite force in A and of the mechanical advantages of each muscle in B, C, and D. Uh, and we can see that predatory acodonts depicted here in triangles um, have lower bite forces and lower mechanical advantages in general, which characterizes a fast and weak bite. And here we see the phylogeny of the species uh, plotted over the shape, the jaw shape morpher space. And we can see that predatory species that are in blue uh, invaded this morpher space area um, more than once, representing functional convergence with more slender and elongated jaws that have in general, as we saw, faster gait and weaker bites. And this also shows us uh, how specialization, in this case, trophic specialization, can increase the morphological diversity of a group. However, this is only one uh, evidence of adaptation since basic patterns of jaw movement that are associated with feeding can have more than just one component. Um, we should consider not only the position uh, of the jaw joint and the shape of the jaw, as we just did, uh, but also teeth morphology and, of course, the anatomy of muscles. So to dig deeper into this, uh, we decided to take a closer look at the muscle morphology of acodontines, adding uh, an extra layer of insight to our investigation of this trophic specialization. We wanted to compare the masticatory uh, muscles of predators, represented here by Oxymicterus and Baryonomys in the red square, and omnivores, represented by Acodom and Acromis on the blue square. So we wanted to know if the functional adaptations that we just saw on the jaw are also reflected uh, on muscle morphology. And in order to do this, we chose to use the DICT technique or diffusible iodine-based contrast enhanced computed tomography. Basically, in this technique, uh, the iodine uh, binds to soft tissues, making them visible in X-ray images, which usually just show more dense material like bones. And DICT uh, represents um, a new approach of, to recover in situ 
uh, internal anatomy, uh, and especially giving us some anatomical context because we can um, scan the whole specimen and just segment the parts that are interesting to us. This technique has been heavily used in the last few years uh, because it has, uh, of course, a lot of advantages. One of them is that it's, not, it's a non-destructive technique, which means that it can be done without causing any permanent damage to the specimen, which uh, often happen in more traditional uh, dissection techniques. And specimens can even be destained after scanning, making this technique reversible. And uh, lastly, the, the resulting images or 3D models can be shared widely. Uh, and we even have digital repositories dedicated entirely to this kind of data, like Morphosaurus and Digimorph. I'm not going over the details here, uh, but this is an example of what we have after the process of staining and scanning and segmenting segmentation of each slice, as we can see in the upper, upper corner, um, which is a 3D model which each muscle identify. This is one of our predatory rats, uh, Oxymicterus. And what I see as one of the most um, cool aspects of this technique is that we can move the model um, around and see some structures that are not e easily seen even if we have the specimen in hand. And a very cool thing to do is try to go inside the brain case and we can go around and see everything uh, that is in there. And the only way of doing that to the actual specimen is breaking the skull, which is not desirable, of course. And we can break down all uh, the layers of each muscle mass. Um, which is great for anatomical and descript descriptive stu studies. And even better than that, we can compare the morphology of these muscles between different species and between species with different ecologies. Here's just a uh, quick look of our sampled species. Again, the predators in the red square, the uh, omnivores or non predatory species on the blue square. And let's see how can they relate to some of the functional features that we have been discussing so far. Let's focus here on the masseter, uh, which is the blue uh, muscle mass, and the temporalis, which is the red one. So um, when comparing muscle morphology uh, of this uh, two different kinds uh, of groups of species, predators um, seem to have smaller masseters which basic uh, tells us something about their bite force because the masseter is the most important muscle, uh, most important jaw closing muscle. And in opposition to that, we see that the non-predatory species in the blue square has more anterior areas of attachment of these muscles, which by itself increase the mechanical advantage and enhance its bite force. So the omnivorous species has um, a more developed masseter and also uh, higher bite forces. And in predators, the, on the contrary, the masseter inserts farther from the incisors, which together with the small volume uh, allows for a wider gape when opening the mouth, which is very useful for subduing prey. And here we can see also the radar chart um, showing the relative volume of each one of this, the main muscle masses for each species. And we can uh, see quantitatively how uh, this can be compared with the predator showing a higher volume of the temporalis and the omnivorous showing uh, high volumes of the masseter. And this is in line with our pre previous findings uh, of smaller areas of attachment uh, for the masseter in the narrow zygomatic plates of uh, invertebrate eating acodontines, uh, as we did found in the first paper, and also with our lower uh, estimated bite forces for the predatory species. And another thing we found was that the temporalis is larger in predatory species. The temporalis is not so active in generating bite force, uh, being more important for stabilizing the jaw joint. This is, uh, this is where the jaw connects to the skull. 
because it, it restricts lateral and anterior posterior movements of uh, the jaw. So how did that compare to other predatory rodents? Um, so a larger temporalis uh, was also observed in Hydromis, which is the semi-aquatic uh, predatory Australian rat, suggesting that jaw stabilization, uh, it's important not only for predatory aquadons, but maybe in general for all predatory species to be able to uh, neutralize struggling prey. And a smaller masseter was also found um, in Onychomys and Idromis, and also Ichthyomys, which is um, a fish eating rat from the Neotropics, which shows the importance of the wide gape for predatory species to be able to catch, uh, especially larger prey like fish and crabs, as we can see here in these pictures. However, um, these species also have uh, bigger or greater mechanical advantages uh, to compensate for this lower muscle volume or this lower masseter volume in order to be able to, to capture and to eat the, their big and resistant prey. But this was not observed in carnivorous acodontines, which has smaller masseter volumes, but as you may remember, also smaller mechanical advantages. And this may be related to differences in the food items uh, consumed by each one of the species. Uh, Onychomys, uh, Idromys, and Ichthyomys uh, include, all of them include small vertebrates in their diet, which may present higher mechanical demands, uh, while Acodontinis um, appears to, go, to eat mainly uh, smaller and more soft vertebrates. And uh, the adaptations related to the feeding mode or the predatory behavior seem to reflect not only behavior, uh, but also the mechanical demands of each kind of prey they, con they usually consume. And these results show us that they, there may be different paths to uh, specialization in eating live prey in rodents. So we decided to expand our taxonomic scope and investigate predatory behavior in all rodents. Um, Bruce has accept accepted me here as a postdoc, even after retiring. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what I've been doing for the last month is, is collect uh, morphological data for each one of the tips of this phylogeny. It's a rodent phylogeny. And here you can see in red the, the predatory species in blue herbivores and in gray omnivores. And by doing so, by having morphological data of all the species, we are going to be able to see the big picture of morphological variation in rodents and how this may or may not relate to diet. And first of all, um, we want to see if what we found for acodontines uh, stands in the larger taxonomic scope, um, which would mean that rodents become predators by increasing their jaw closing speed at the expense of bite force. And considering that we have already found higher rates of morphological evolution uh, on the skull of ecologically specialized acodontines, uh, we also want to quantify and compare uh, the rates of morphological evolution of the skull of predatory rodents, um, assuming that they may be, may be under stronger selective pressures. We also want to know if this specialization involved different adaptive peaks. Uh, if you think, for example, about true rats and fish eating rats, um, each has a distinct set of sensory and locomotory traits, which may indicate uh, kind of unique uh, strategies within the a broader uh, category of predatory behavior. We still don't know that. And another thing we just started investigating is the brain of predatory species, uh, the endocast that we see here in purple. Uh, it's a model made from the internal cavity of the brain case, uh, which is assumed to be a reliable reconstruction of the brain itself. So we can compare having endocasts, uh, can compare specific areas uh, that are thought to be related to the hunting uh, activity, such as the olfactory bulbs. The olfactory bulbs, um, highlighted here in red, um, receives narrow input from the 
uh, smell uh, activity cells uh, in, the nasal in the nasal cavity. And we would expect larger bulbs um, in predatory species, especially considering the already known findings that I, I showed earlier of more developed olf olfactory terminals on some of the species. But of course, this still remains to be uh, tested. And a little beyond that, uh, you also like to assess the brain of fish eating rodents more specifically. This is Nilopegamis plumbeus, uh, a species only known by its type specimen, uh, was collected in 1927. And it's luckily for us, it's housed here at the Field Museum. And some years ago, uh, Julian Kirby's and Bruce Patterson were intrigued about the morphology of Nilopegamis skull and how it could relate to the semi-aquatic uh, predatory lifestyle. And that's because uh, it's commonly known that amphibious mammals uh, species typ typically have enlarged brains, uh, which is related to the, to, to the process of navigating through complex uh, 3D uh, environment uh, of the aquatic um, realm. And in fact, Julian and Bruce uh, found relatively larger in a very elegant and smart way found relatively larger and est uh, estimated brain weights for Nilopegamis and other semi-aquatic species if compared to terrestrial counterparts, as we can see here in the figure. And uh, semi-aquatic uh, rodents uh, also show a well-developed trigeminal nerve, as we can see here in red, which is uh, the nerve that innervates the muzzle vibrissa or the whiskers. And the whiskers uh, can serve as a kind of sonar to detect vibrations uh, of aquatic invertebrates or other kind of prey, being very useful to hunting for this aquatic prey. And that's why they are usually so developed in semi-aquatic species, especially in semi-aquatic predatory species as Neocicomis multicolus. And recently we could scan the Nilopegamis specimen that we have here at the Field Museum and now we can make models of their brain to compare with other semi-aquatic and predatory rats. And now we can uh, analyze different, different parts of the brain or endocranium to see what could relate to these uh, spe specializations for the semi-aquatic or predatory um, ecologies. So I'd like to finish uh, on a more personal note. When I was here back in 2017, I got to know the Field Museum's um, Women in Science group, uh, watching their lectures and panels. I believe in that year, the theme was scientific communication. And I really liked that, that idea. And I decided to propose a similar group back in, in the university. I was doing my, my PhD at the time in Brazil. And that's what I did, we did. Uh, I got together with some other women from my department, the zoology department, and we created the group. But it was only during the pandemic that our group really consolidated, uh, especially first at social media, uh, where we created several, several thematic series to, to show the work do, uh, done by women in science in Brazil and around the world. It may seem little for some, but maintaining the consistency uh, required by social media, um, especially at the beginning when we are mostly a small group of millennials, was very hard. And also during the pandemic, as everyone else, uh, we streamed several talks about gender inequality in academia. And this really helped us to keep us motivated to continue to do this. And that made me realize that creating the group was the easiest part. Maintaining it was very hard and maintaining people uh, still motivated to do this because it's basically voluntary work. No one's getting paid. But I'm very happy to say we're very strong and active still today. In the last year, we won a scholarship, so someone's getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and we have an undergraduate student who works part-time on some of the group's demands. We managed to start the Girls in Science uh, project this year, uh, where we welcomed girls, uh, welcomed girls from primary and secondary schools to our university to show what scientists do. I participated in the first edition, and as most of us are aware, 
part of the zoology department, we had uh, several stands with collection material to show them uh, what can be done with this material. And some of them have never even saw a bat uh, taxidermize and some stuff like that. And it was very enriching for, for them and for us too, of course. And I've been here at the Field Museum for some months uh, when I was away from uh, most of the group's activities. And I'm ext extremely happy to see that they are developing several new projects that I know very little about. Uh, for example, this mentoring program with girls from public, public schools, uh, showing these girls how to get into the universities and talking about all the government incent incentives uh, that we have that can help them to do so. And this is especially important considering that many of these girls uh, still do not see an academic career as a viable one. So um, we still... Uh, getting started with this, uh, they are still getting started with this, but we hope to see um, this helping a lot of them to, to at least get more interested and see this as an option. So after what I can call a rough start, I hope to see this group uh, grow for the next many, many years. And I'm very thankful um, to, to have had the first contact with a group like this here at the Field Museum back in 2017. So with that, I would like to thank all my uh, co-authors and collaborators, the curators and staff of the Memo Collection of the Field Museum, also the Smithsonian and American Museum, the funding agencies, of course, uh, and the Armor Talk series and Latinx Heritage Month for having me here today, and all of you for being here listening, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that the temporalis has enlarged in predatory rats to help stabilize the jaw joints and the forces involved the, uh, with weaker masters. I'm wondering if there are changes in the conformation of the glenoid fossa that might assist this process of stabilization. OK. Um, just a little. <clears throat> Clarification, the glenoid fossa is where the jaw meets the skull. And in rodents, it's a little bit different from other mammals. In mammals, uh, it is like this. And in rodents, it is like this. So the, the jaw can do anteroposterior movements. So this is a great question uh, because it does not also, uh, uh, only have to stabilize lateral movement, but also anteroposterior. Uh, we did not yet analyze any of that, but has been uh, seen that the predatory rodents, for some reason, have uh, the, when you look at the skull, let me see if I have, like here, uh, the predatory rodents have the incisors close together uh, in the standing position of the skull compared with non-predatory rodents that when the incisors are more apart which could tell us something about the position of the jaw uh, in the species uh, that does not permit so many anteroposterior movements. But that's just conjecturing so far because I never analyzed this. I hope it was, it was okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, okay, so you said that you were interested in looking for adaptive peaks in predatory rodents. So um, in the 2021 paper, are those like performance surfaces that you put together with the heat maps in the background? Um, you, have you tried uh, looking for adaptive peaks using those, like combining them together? Hmm. Not at the time, but when I was looking to them after the muscle uh, data, um yeah so those there was just uh afterthought i haven't still uh, looked back into this but i can see that some uh, predatory species uh show differences in the mechanical advantages of some muscles for example in b the deep mass the deep masseter some species on the down part the, which are oxymeters have larger mechanical advantages which may show some 
differences in the, the type of uh, or the mechanical functioning of their jaws. Mm -hmm. So I just at the time I didn't take much attention to this, uh, but now I can see that maybe maybe some of them may have different adaptive peaks, even inside the codontini. But I have to take a closer look and yeah. go back to this data, of course, and compare this to the, the muscles to see if the oxymicterus and the other ones have any differences also in muscle volume, for example. There's like ways you can calculate selection strength yes. on different traits. Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah, thanks. Awesome talk. Um, so I was just wondering about the specifically aquatic predatory rodents. Are those pretty convergent across the tree or are they more clustered phylogenetically? Uh, both, <laughs> because uh, we have like uh, more than one cluster. So we have uh, semi-aquatic predators from uh, Papua New Guinea, Australia, that are very specialized, but you also have very similar uh, semi-aquatic predators from uh, Neotropics, Central America, and South America. And they have, I must say, they have very similar schools. Uh, they have like the nasals uh, that stands most, more posterior. And some people say that's because helps them to to breed, go to surface and breed. So they have all these features that show this specialization and seems to be very convergent, but they are not all scattered, except for Nilopegamis. Nilopegamis and Colomis, a sister species in Africa, uh, they, are, they, they are not such a big radiation, but also very convergent. So we could have basically three uh, different uh, appearances, but uh, very diverse inside of most of them. Cool. I, ho I hope that answered. Yeah, totally. And a related question. Uh, so, what, what what is the the correlation between um, aquatic habit and being uh, a predator? Uh, so, are all aquatic, same aquatic uh, uh, rodents also predatory or not? And uh, how how could this uh, be a confounding factor in, in looking at a, a predatory behavior against just being aquatic? That's a good question. So um, the thing is, um, we don't know which came first, if it was the predatory behavior or the invasion of the semi-aquatic niche. What we know is that not so many rodents uh, invade the semi-aquatic niche. And the ones that invade it and are not predators like capybaras and hutias, they are very big and they eat mainly grass and plant material. So, um, and some people have said that that might be reasons for the invasion of the semi-aquatic uh, environment by predatory ro rodents uh, be not very common because they have, in the aquatic environment, we will have a lot of other predators that could eat these rodents, like big fishes and stuff like that, and other uh, semi-aquatic mammals, but, um, yeah, it's a very interesting thing to, to still investigate, and we're not very sure about some of that because there are so few species. That's a problem. Uh, there are few species that are hard to capture. They are very rare in, rare in collections, and we know basically nothing about their ecology. So I don't know if I answered, but if not, I can. Yeah, well, well, one part of it was uh, which traits that you're looking at. Uh, if they're related like, to being a predator and not just being. Ah, okay, so how can we differentiate like what it, yeah. Uh, so that's why we need to look at the brain and the muscles and other stuff because we have, for example, a lot of post cranial traits that are related to locomotion while diet, it's mainly related to cranial stuff. Although we also have uh, like locomotory traits in the cranial. Um, but yeah, it's hard to set apart. So, and it's hard because the other semi-aquatic not predators have very different skulls. So it seems to be a very specific thing, but we still need to investigate more like the brain and see what are related, what is related and what's not to hunting and to swimming. But yeah, more work on that still. Any last questions? We have time for a few more. Thanks, Martha.
Thank you very much.